To generalize, people only put energy into something if they feel they're going to get what they want out of it. This is also true when it comes to relationships. A person won't put energy into a specific relationship unless they feel like they're going to get what they want out of that relationship. If a person doesn't feel that way, doesn't feel that they will get what they want out of the relationship, they tend to become apathetic towards the relationship. There are all kinds of things that a person might want to get out of a relationship, such as a sense of belonging, intimacy, togetherness, sex, trust, a sense of security, protection, shared experience, affection, attention, prioritization, emotional connection, joint goals, romance, significance, respect, kindness, honesty, dedication, excitement, encouragement, self-esteem, acceptance, not to be lonely anymore, and the list just goes on and on. If a person is in a relationship specifically for any one of these things and starts to feel like they won't get it, they can become apathetic towards the relationship. Therefore, if you're in a relationship with someone who is behaving apathetically towards you or towards the relationship, it's very smart to consider that the reason might be that they want something out of the relationship that they're not getting. Maybe even something that they feel they're not going to get. But today, I am going to expose the deepest, most unconscious, and most difficult to recognize relationship apathy pattern, and I'm going to tell you what to do about it. First, I'll tell you what the pattern is, and then I'll break it down for you so you completely understand it. The pattern is that a person's deepest desire is to be loved for who they are, and they perceive that they aren't going to get that in a relationship, and so they become apathetic towards the relationship. The first thing that's important to understand is that when someone says that they want to be loved, 99% of the time, they don't actually mean that they want to be loved. What they mean is that they want to be valued, appreciated, and therefore wanted. So really, this pattern is about wanting to be valued for who they are. The second thing that is important to understand is that in the context of the desire to be valued, who you are is a meaningless term. What does it mean? There are some questions you must consider if you want to be loved for who you are, slash if you want to be loved for you. One is, who and or what are you? Two, what is it about you that you want to be valued, appreciated, and wanted for? What is it exactly that you're asking other people to value, appreciate, and want about you? To understand this pattern, we need to go way back into childhood. In some families, a child gets the message that their only value is what they do for their parent or for other members of the family. They feel their only value is essentially in their use. This leads to both extreme insecurity and exhaustion because it feels like they're on this never-ending treadmill to earn their place every day and will lose it the second they stop. To use an analogy, imagine a horse that's valued and wanted only for the fact that it races, and if the day comes that it doesn't race, immediately it's not valued anymore and is rejected and discarded. Inside this child is a deep desire. This deep desire that is being born is the desire to be valued for something intrinsic to them, something that is not dependent on their service or lack thereof, or dependent on their performance or lack thereof. They want to be valued, appreciated, and wanted for something that has nothing to do with their use. The problem is, the only way this person knows how to be valued enough to be wanted is to be of use. And so they will enter into a relationship with someone who is very obvious and very desperate needs, even to the degree that they need rescue. Therefore, again, they will be valued for what they do for the other person. But they will secretly hope and expect that to the contrary, doing so will magically lead to that person valuing them for who they are instead. This person is going to be a person who starts out the relationship pouring their energy into the relationship and into the other person. The exact opposite of apathy. Because they think everything they are doing will lead to them being valued, appreciated, and wanted for who they are. But then the day comes where something happens that causes them to perceive that they will never be valued, appreciated, and wanted for who they are. And so they begin to test it. They start to drop things that they were doing for the relationship and for the other person. Naturally, this makes the other person upset at them. And this is further confirmation that they are only valued, appreciated, and wanted for their use. And so they go into full-blown apathy mode. 
they drop responsibilities, they don't put energy into the relationship or into the other person, they emotionally withdraw, they act completely passive and unhappy, they act unworkable, quite frankly, they become unresponsive, they lose their enthusiasm, <laughs> and when the relationship spirals down to hell, they don't put any energy into making changes to improve the relationship. They stop actively participating, essentially, in the relationship and even sink into depression because it's too painful to accept that in the relationship, they won't be valued, appreciated, and loved just for who they are and because they don't want to sign up for a life or a relationship where they aren't. Suddenly, the other person feels like they're in the relationship alone and as if they were the only one putting energy into it and as if they were duped. So that you can understand this pattern better, here's an example. Michael was born into a poor family with lots and lots of kids. He was left in the crib a lot as a baby because, let's be honest, every member of the family was too busy doing what needed to be done to get by. When he was old enough to pitch in, he was immediately put to work, tending to his siblings, taking on tasks around the household, even helping to bring an in income. No one in the house was valued for anything other than what they practically provided or practically did. For example, Michael had an incredible sense of humor, but no one cared. All they cared about is whether he lit the wood fires first thing in the morning or brought back enough money from his after-school job. Michael is now an adult. Since his life experiences taught him that he holds no value other than what he does, he has deep insecurities about his own worth. This causes him to get into relationships with women who desperately need a man because they are fending for themselves. Michael does this because by doing so, he does not risk rejection. Also, all he knows is to be in a relationship with someone who really needs him for something that he does. The woman he's with now, Kelsey, is a single mother with a history of severe sex abuse. She needs all the things that a father would provide, but that her father never provided, and then some. She needs someone to provide for her financially. She needs protection. She needs a father figure for her daughter. She needs a man to be there for her whenever she needs him emotionally. She needs to be supported in her goals. She wants to be taken care of and taken responsibility for. Michael is convinced on a subconscious level that if he steps up to such a degree for Kelsey, she will fall in love with him for who he is. What he means by this is Kelsey will value, appreciate, and want him for his soul. For how he feels for a sense of humor, for the way his body feels against hers. You know, for everything that takes no effort on his part because it isn't about what he does. The thing is, Kelsey actually does value him for all those things, but the reason she got into a primary partnership arrangement with him isn't because of all those things. It's because of all the things he does for her. Things like taking responsibility for upkeep around the house and paying for bills and bringing home dinner for them all and talking her through her problems for hours and providing incredible containment and setting up elaborate dates. One day, Michael runs into a situation where he doesn't have enough money to pay the grocery bill, and Kelsey gets upset about it. A shockwave goes through Michael's system. Suddenly, he feels like his security with Kelsey and his place in her life is dependent on his use. In this case, financial providership. He's in a state of constant anxiety then. He doesn't talk to Kelsey about this fear, Instead, he decides to test whether this is in fact the case. He doesn't put the trash out on the street on trash pickup day, like he has of his own accord every other week in their relationship. Again, Kelsey gets upset. She becomes afraid that all the pressure is starting to fall back on her shoulders, and like she is going to have to either do everything herself or manage Michael to do them as if he was a child. When Kelsey gets upset, Michael's worst fears become even more real. She might never love him for who he is. And it's at this point that progressively he goes into full-blown apathy mode. Michael starts dropping all the responsibilities that he signed up for in their relationship. He stops doing anything romantic. He stops initiating sex. He withdraws emotionally and spends most of his time working, but he passes up opportunities to make a lot of money because he doesn't want Kelsey to value him for how much money he has. He stops providing containment. He leaves her to fend for herself in conflicts with other people in her life. And when the relationship really turns bad, right there in that downward spiral, he is uncharacteristically passive about it. He won't read books about how to make the relationship better, 
when Kelsey tells him clearly what he needs to do to make her feel happy in the relationship again, he doesn't do it, almost passive-aggressively. He reluctantly shows up to a visit with a marital therapist, but doesn't go back. Kelsey has lost her partner. Michael has slipped into an apathetic depression, leaving her to fend for herself and carry him. He's stuck in that depression because he can't consciously admit that what he wants is to be loved for who he is, and Kelsey is a woman with a very serious and practical need, many of them, in fact. She will never love him enough for who he is to have that be the reason to be in a primary relationship with him, nor would it be for any man, for that matter. Part of Michael's despair is that he truly believes that this is the very thing he offers Kelsey, something that he feels he can give to any woman in his life, this sort of unconditional love, but that he never receives in return. If you ask him, he will say that he always ends up in relationships that are conditional when all he wants in the world and what he offers is unconditional love. What Michael doesn't realize is that he is also in a conditional relationship with Kelsey. The need he's trying to meet and what he's trying to get out of a relationship is esteem. His childhood led him to believe that he is a worthless person outside of his use. He wants a woman to value, appreciate, and want him for things that have nothing to do with his use so that he feels a sense of esteem. And if he doesn't get that in the relationship, he stops participating in the relationship. He becomes apathetic. On top of this, he dupes the women he enters into relationships with by entering into the relationship on the foot of value me because of all the things I can do for you, only to drop the relationship when it becomes obvious that they do, because his real request underneath that is value me for who I am, regardless of what I do or don't do for you. Needless to say, Michael and Kelsey's relationship ended, and both of them are re-traumatized because the relationship was a repeat of each of their original wounding. If you recognize yourself in this pattern, the first thing you need to do is to throw away the idea that there is a right and wrong reason to be in a relationship. People who want to be loved for who they are love to defend this desire by believing that it is the only right, the only good, and the only true reason to be with a person in a relationship. There's nothing wrong with a person being in a relationship with someone for any reason, provided that there is mutual agreement about it. What causes pain in relationships is a mismatch. A mismatch between what someone is valued, appreciated, and wanted for, and what they want to be valued, appreciated, and wanted for. In the relationship with Michael and Kelsey, there is a mismatch between what Michael is valued, appreciated, and wanted for and what he wants to be valued, appreciated, and wanted for. The second thing you need to do is to figure out what you want to be valued, appreciated, and wanted for, specifically. When a person says, I want to be loved for who I am, or I want someone to love me for me, that is super abstract. What it usually means is that the person has a certain specific aspect, or aspects, plural, about them that were never valued, appreciated, and wanted. Potentially, they've been rejected for those things in the past, or potentially those things have never been adequately recognized. On top of this, they may have been valued, appreciated, and wanted for something they don't want to be valued, appreciated, and wanted for. So, what does this mean? It means you need to figure out exactly what it is about you that you want to have be appreciated, valued, and wanted. To understand more about this, you can watch my video titled, Want to be loved for who you are? Watch this. Using our example, Michael realizes that he wants to be loved for his presence, for the way he feels to the other person energetically, for the feeling of his touch, for his humor, for his ideas, for the sound of his voice, and for how nice he is. The third thing you need to do is decide whether or not being valued, appreciated, and wanted for those things is a requirement for a partnership, or whether you could have a partnership with someone based off of another agreement and establish other relationships in your life where this need is met. If the answer is yes, you will either need to find out if your partner can change the reasons for being in a partnership with you, or you need to end the partnership. I need to warn you that it is very rare that a person will simply change their reason for being in the relationship with you when you change what it is that you're offering, simply because you decided that you want them to be in a relationship with you for 
something other than what you offered to begin with. If you decide that being valued, appreciated, and wanted for certain things is not a requirement for a partner and could get this need men in other relationships, you need to drop the apathy and start stepping up and into the relationship. Let's look at our example. Michael decides that he wants a partnership to be based off of a person valuing, appreciating, and wanting him for these things, rather than for things like providing financially, or offering containment, or protecting them, or taking on responsibilities around the house. So what does this mean? He decides that it was right for the relationship with Kelsey to end. In fact, it wasn't right to be with her in the first place. But he can see that he was the one who duped her. So he meets up with her for coffee to offer a serious apology and explain his pattern and why everything happened the way that it did. The fourth thing you need to do is to advertise whatever it is about you that you want someone to value, appreciate, and want. Part of this implies communicating with other people about specifically what you want them to appreciate, value, and want about you. And never forget that you are more likely to be appreciated, valued, and wanted for something when you advertise that thing specifically to the people who are most likely to value, appreciate, and want that thing. This means if you don't want to be valued for your use, i.e. for what you do for someone, then you need to not set up the relationship on the foot of, I will do these things for you. You have to be willing to take the risk of putting what you want people to value, appreciate, and want out there. Using our example, Michael stops looking for women who need rescue because they are carrying too much responsibility and are too alone. Instead, he decides to look for women who are very resourced. These are women who are very close to their family and have lots of close friends. And rather than taking on responsibilities or doing things for them, what he offers is quality time and touch. This way he can tell that they are in a relationship with him for what he wants them to be in a relationship with him for. Relationships need to be fed. A relationship will end if it's approached with apathy. For this reason, it is critical to know what you want to be appreciated, valued, and wanted for in a relationship, and it is critical to know what you want to get out of a relationship. And it is critical to make sure that you are on the same page and in agreement with the other person about both. Have a good week. Thank you.